Tonight's going to be a Bible study. Someone say Bible study. We are going to study the word and, and this portion of scripture, realistically, as I'm going through it, you almost need a teacher to get you through this portion of scripture. I, I, was, I was tempted to just go right through it, but we're going through the book of Matthew and we're going verse by verse. And I actually thought that the team just skipped over this verse and just left it for me. Like that's a hard verse. I'm not going to do that one. But let's look at this portion of scripture. But this portion of scripture we're going to go over really is important because it gives you the foundation for your faith. Some would say foundation for faith. Now, what I mean by that is that I want you to think about this. We are eternal beings. And what that means is that you're going to live a portion of your life here on earth but it's the smallest portion that you'll live is here on earth. The Bible talks about this. It says our life on earth is but a vapor. And that means if you're all in, in, you're putting all your eggs in this basket, you're putting all your eggs in the wrong basket. Time goes by really fast. And for some of us that are getting older, you realize that time is even moving faster. And you start realizing as you get older, what's really important. And you can't just waste your time partying your whole life because you could waste your whole life. And there's a right way to live a life and there's a wrong way to live a life. But think about this. Imagine you live the wrong way and you end up in hell forever. So why'd you say that, Pastor? Because after you die, there really is only two locations. Either you're going to be with God forever and ever in a place there's just no pain there's no hurt there's no sickness there's no death there's no suffering or you're going to be separated from God in a place where there's pain there's hurt there's suffering but the problem is and you would say well that sounds a lot like earth it sounds a lot like earth with no relief with no hope because while we're here on earth we're making not only temporary decisions we're making eternal decisions and I talk to people as a pastor that are on the verge of death. And everyone that's on the verge of death, they're calling me just to make sure that they're right with God. Because nobody that's breathing their last breath is thinking about how clean their car is, what's in their bank account, or how good their clothes look, or whether their nails are done. What they're thinking about is I'm ready to believe, breathe my last breath and I'm not sure I'm right with God. I'm ready to go into eternity. Well, this Bible prepares us not only for this life, but it prepares us for the next one. And if you Gain the whole world. I mean, you know what the Bible says? If you gain this whole world, that means you get everything this world has to offer. And what does this world have to offer? It has to offer like real nice locations to visit. If you want to go to, you know, I, I just went to Puerto Rico. That's great. But Puerto Rico has graffiti just like San Bernardino. Right? Has problems just like San Bernardino. You know, it offers nice places to visit. It offers cars, but anybody that's ever had a nice car, after you get the nice car, you want a nicer car. Isn't that right? If I get that car, that'll be the last car. I'm just going to buy that car. I'm going to keep it forever. It's going to be collector's item. I got, no, you ain't. Until the next model comes out that has more horsepower, that looks a little better, and, and, and you don't have to change the tires it, it, because it's brand new and your tires are wore out, right? You start thinking that way. What, what does offer? What's we offer? Relationships. And be careful that you're not exchanging a temporal relationship for eternal relationship. And that's why a lot of us, we, we think relationships are going to make us whole, and then you get a relationship, and then you abuse that relationship, and you're waiting for the next relationship. We treat people like they're disposable objects. And you know why? Because we're looking for more. We're thinking there must be more. What does this world offer? Drugs, drinking, partying. But no matter how much you party, no matter how much you drink, you still want another drink. It leaves you empty. 
So what was, what the Bible is saying, let's say you gain the houses, you gain the cars, you get the women, you get the guys, you get everything this world has to offer. And at the end, you lose your soul. You missed it all. So now this is the question. God created you and I, and how do we make sure we're right with God? So say it with me, right with God. And there's only two ways that people try to get right with God. One way that people try to get right with God, they try to get right with God by doing good. If I, if I ask people, if tonight were your last night and you, you were to stand before God, are you sure you're right with God? And they usually say this, I think I am. And I'm going to say, why? And they say, because I'm a pretty good person. And what they're basically saying is, I got a code of ethics that I came up with, or I've read a few things about the Bible, and I'm pretty good at obeying them. But are you sure being pretty good at obeying scriptures that you know is going to get you into heaven? I'm even going to say this. Are you sure if you obey, if you obey the majority of scripture, will you get into heaven? Are you sure that if you're better than your neighbor and you obey a little better, are you going to get into heaven? So Jesus was addressing this eternal thing and he was addressing it to some religious leaders. And he was telling them, there's a standard of living that I've put in this word. But this standard that I've put in this word is my standard. What's the standard? God's standard, not my standard. It's God. Someone say God's standard. He goes, so when I gave you my word and I gave you my standards, they were my standards. He goes, but you guys got a problem. You don't live up to my standards. You guys get this? Come on. How many know that we fall short of God's standards? So Jesus was addressing this, this subject here. And let's look at Matthew 5, 17. And it says this. Don't min misunderstand why I came. Don't min misunderstand why I came. I didn't come to be just a prophet. I didn't just come here to be a teacher. I came to get something done. Someone say, to get something done. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses. And what he's saying is, I didn't come to lower the standards of, of what I've already taught you in the Old Testament. How many know the Bible is written, it's written in two, has, two, has a, it's two halves, the New Testament and the what? So at this time, they only had the Old Testament. And the, and, and the law of Moses was really referring to the five books, five first books of the Bible, which is also called the Torah. And in those five books, God gives, for example, the Ten Commandments. And he gives them these laws, hey, and these are some of the laws he wrote down. He said this, um, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. What he was saying is, don't put anything before me. I won't allow, this is what he's saying, I won't allow you to put me second, and second will never be good enough for me. See, some people think they could get to heaven, and Jesus is not even second. Some people, they think they're going to get into heaven and Jesus is barely on the list. He's not a top priority and we know it's not a top priority because we struggle giving him time. And whatever the priority for you, you give time to. So you might be saying, I don't serve other gods. Maybe you don't have little idols in your house that you're worshiping and lighting candles to, but this is the idea. What are you get prioritizing over God that has more say than God in your life? Do you know a drug could be your God? An attitude could be your God? A car could be your God? A thing could be your God? Your job can be your God? Your girlfriend could be your God? Your boyfriend could be your God? Your, come on, your family member could be your God? Your schedule could be your God? Your comfort could be your God? If it's not easy, I don't do it. 
That's your God, Eve. We're still talking about the, he goes, so I want you to understand this. I didn't come, what he was saying is, I didn't come to lower the standards to make it easier for you guys. Because this is what we want to do. The Bible says in the last days, there's going to group, be a group of people that they're going to want teachers that teach them what they want to hear. You know what the Bible says? Tickle their ears. They'll be like, tickle me, daddy. Like when I want to, this is what they're saying. When I come to church, I want to feel good. Because my God is feel good. I want to feel like when I go to a baseball game, they entertain me. And that's what, and I'll tell you this, and this is why we, sometimes we can't serve God. Because our God is a God of feel good. Whatever feels good is my God. You can't even be married like that. Because you'll be tempted by any girl to make you feel good. That's not your wife. Come on, somebody. Look at another command that he gave. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What he was saying by that is stop using my name while you're just talking and cussing. Stop using my name as a cuss word, homie. Why is my name in your mouth and you're not praising me? Why did you use my name more when you were in the world than now that you're a Christian? Some of us are using God's name in vain. And, and this is an issue we think is a big joke. But understand this, the idea, I think every one of us have used God's name in vain. And I know this, see, I, I got a problem with this law already because all this law is showing me I'm guilty. Like just going over that alone, I have, I have a problem with, I have no other gods before you. I put a lot of stuff before you, Jesus. Look at this. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Now you say, well, I never kill nobody. Praise the Lord. I got it. I finally found a commandment I obeyed. <laughs> Hopefully it judges me on just that one. You guys think it's going to be like a test? And the only answer you know, you, uh, like, there's three tests and you're thinking, if I just get on this one that I do know, I hope that's the one because I'll ace that. God's not going to judge us on the, on, I, I watch you guys. He's not going to judge mankind on the best one that you're obeying. But the truth is, Jesus came and said, you know, you've heard killing is bad. But he said this, if you're angry with a brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. So Jesus was like saying, you haven't killed nobody physically, but you've killed people emotionally in your head. You're seeing them dead. I wish they were dead. Go to hell. You and your mama. And now Sunday, hallelujah. Salsa, hallelujah. She's doing a lot. Of Acting. All I'm saying, say, Pastor, why are we going for this? Because Jesus is saying, I didn't come to abolish the law. What he's saying is, I didn't come to lower the standards. The standards are still the same. So we're going to talk about that. I said, well, we got a problem then, don't we? Thou shalt not commit adultery was another one. That means if you're married, you're not supposed to be sleeping around with somebody that's not your husband or wife. But, 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 but pastor, come on, stop tripping. My wife ain't treating me right. I don't even remember the last meal she cooked for me. And the last meal she cooked for me was, was, some, was, some, was some spaghetti in a can. And the other thing, she don't respect me.
That's right. And the girl at work, she nice to me. She respects me. And you know what I'm thinking? She wasn't for me from the beginning. Because what God puts together, let no man separate. I found a scripture. God didn't put us together. You know what you're doing? You're lying to yourself to justify your adultery. And I, I'm going to tell you this. We are good liars and justifiers and lawyers. You all of a sudden using scripture to justify your adulterous affair. If you're, if you're married, you can't be with nobody else. It's called adultery. It don't matter what you call it. Well, someone said, well, you know, pastor, that was great. Great try, but I'm not committing adultery. And the truth is, I've never committed adultery. I've been faithful to my wife and husband all these years. That's awesome. But Jesus goes on to say, if you even lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery. Like, oh, oh, well, well now, yeah, I did commit adultery. <laughs> So Jesus said, I'm not coming to abolish the law of Moses and the prophets. Thou shalt not steal. Now, the problem is these laws are there, but in the Torah, there's 613 laws. These are 10 commandments, but in the Torah, there's 613 laws. They said, well, what's the big deal, pastor? This is the big deal. That if you are trying to get into heaven by being obedient to these 613 laws, you ain't going to make it. Well, how am I going to get in then? This is the difference between religion and relationship with Jesus. Jesus made a way for you to have a relationship with him, to be forgiven of every one of your sins and, and take you out from under the curse that you put yourself under by the bad decisions me and you have made. Because the truth is, this is who we are or who I am. I'll say who I am. I've worshiped other gods. I'm an adulterer, thief. I kill some people in my mind. <laughs> and you know, what I, mean, what I mean by that is, yeah, there's some people that I've thought in my mind, if they die, I'll be okay. Come on. They're getting quiet. Like, uh, not, not me, Pastor. Well, you're more righteous than me. So when we talk about Jesus not abolishing the law, what he's saying is, I've not come to lower the standards. So, but this is what he's saying. If you think you're going to get to heaven and you're going to be right with me by trying to be perfectly, by perfectly obeying the law, you'll never get in. So what, 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 what are we talking about now? Let's keep on talking about this for a minute. Every law that Jesus, that God gave, came with a blessing and a curse. Someone say, blessing and curse. What I mean by that is, if you obeyed it, you got blessed. And if you disobeyed it, you got cursed. Imagine if they did that to us on the freeway. You obey the, you obey the law of speed, the speed limit, your car works. You don't obey it, your engine blows up. <laughs> Everybody be walking up in here. <laughs> Have you ever got pulled over by police and tell them you weren't speeding? It don't matter. You are a speeder. Maybe that moment you're only going, and you're talking about you're only going 10 miles over the speed limit. What we're talking about, what are we talking about? Every law came with a blessing and a curse. 
Look at this law, which was a cra- look, real simple law. Exodus 20, 12. Look what it says. This is a blessing. Someone say blessing. blessing. Honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord God is giving you. That's cool. So it's saying if you honor your father and your mother, you would have an extension of life in a place of blessing. So what, it be, what it's saying is you'll have a long, blessed life. How many want to have a long, blessed life? Okay, now will you sign up for this blessing? You would sign up only if you didn't know the curse if you didn't honor your father and your mother. So if you dishonored your father and your mother, look what it says here in Leviticus 20. So if you obeyed it, you got a blessing. If you disobeyed it, you got a curse. Leviticus 29. For anyone, this is before Jesus came. Thank you, Jesus. Because all you guys would be dead after this scripture right here. We wouldn't even have a church. Because the consequences were severe. For everyone who curses, look at this, his father and mother or his mother shall surely be put to death. Did I, did I, son, what did I hear from you? What was, did I hear underneath your breath? I don't think I heard what I think I heard. Because you know I could take you out right now if you're dead. The law tells me I could do this. Now, would they actually carry this out? They would. Once, back in those days, a child dishonored their parents by cussing them out. They were brought outside the city and stoned to death. And they, this is what they figured. If he's cussing his mother or father out now, what is he going to do when he's older? The idea was that sin came with a payment. And I think we've lost the fear of God understanding this, that when you make a bad decision, it's going to come with a payment. Getting quiet up in here today. But just imagine, you just die, man. So the law, someone say the law. The law of Moses demanded a sacrifice every time a sin was committed. So there was no such thing as committing a sin without a sacrifice brought with that sin. And if you didn't bring the sacrifice, the curse remained on you. So if you sin, this is what's crazy. This is what, look what happened. In Leviticus 16, 11 says, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. The idea was every sin had a penalty of death upon it. Either the sinner dies for his sins or he presents a sacrifice to die in his place. Just imagine sinning and bringing a bull. We would have a lot of bull in this church. (laughs) And then you wouldn't just bring a bull. They would cut it, kill the bull, and let it bleed. It was a life for a life. This was actually the priest that would represent the people. Aaron, he would represent the people. Because back in those days, no one could come into the presence of God. Only chosen people like a priest could go into the presence of God. And he could only go into the presence of God if he paid, if he brought a payment for his sin. We're thinking, so I want you to think about, I think today, just because we're not bringing instant payment, we think actually there's no payment. The difference between us and them is that we're storing up payment. You know what that's called? Storing up wrath. You know what I really believe? There's levels in hell. Some people are going to be in the big down, the the chambers of hell. The idea is there's going to be different levels of pain and suffering. 
it's all going to be hopeless. It's all going to be dark. It's all going to be bad. But there's going to be different levels because you're storing up levels of wrath and payment. Whew. Kill, kill, kill. Look at this. Then after the priest kills the, the, this big bull and the blood is shed for his sins, a life for a life, he then kills the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring, brings his blood inside the veil and, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat. So the idea here is, is now he's, he's bringing a goat for the sins of the people. So how it was is you couldn't just stand before God because if you stand, stood before God with no covering of blood, you would die. So someone had to represent you that was covered. So basically what you would, it would be kind of like this. We touch the goat and put all our sins on that poor little goat and said, go die for me. Because the wage of sin is death. And you would see the blood of that goat and you would know this. It was that, that goat died for the sins I committed. But there would be no way to be forgiven of sin back in those days if there was no bloodshed, a life for a life. So they lived very alert. They weren't saved. They weren't born again. But they were very alert, understanding this, that sin has blessed. I mean, I mean the law has blessings and it has curses. It's a two-edged sword. Hmm. So Jesus said, I've not come to abolish this law. No, I came to accomplish its purpose, their purpose. I tell you the truth in verse 18, Matthew 5, 18. The, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Now, what's the purpose of a law? And then we're going to get to the good part. Someone say get to, get to the good part. Now, the reason I, I want you to understand this, because it will get you to appreciate this, what Jesus did for you. Because Jesus is the sacrifice for your sins. Do you know what that means? Is that we've all messed up. And because we've messed up, we could be in this room with a guilt trip. Man, I've really messed up. And when you really mess up, you kind of feel like you deserve to be punished. And see, when you feel you deserve to be punished, you know what you do to yourself? You self-destruct yourself. You start doing stuff like this. I don't care. Well, I'll kill you. I, I don't even care if you kill me. I'm ready to die. I, do what you need. Do what you need to do. You know what happens? You start living a reckless life. There was a day you used to be careful. You're not careful anymore. You can even start thinking about suicidal thoughts. You're thinking, you know, I don't care. I don't care if I die. And you know what that is? It's a guilt trip. Yeah. You've lost the value for your life. Yeah. And there's something over you that's telling you you're no good. You're not worth it. But there's a God that says this. I gave you a law and I know you can't fulfill it. But I'm going to send you a savior that can't fulfill it for you. He's gonna walk it out for you. He's gonna live it out for you. He's gonna overcome every single thing that you've ever faced, overcome your depression, overcome your addiction, overcome your sin, overcome your failure, and he's gonna give you a victory. He's gonna give you forgiveness. He's gonna give you right standing. He's gonna give you a new start, a new beginning, and all you need to do is have faith in Jesus, not faith in yourself and your performance. I'm going to break the guilt trip off of you today. Say, Pastor, I thought you were giving us a guilt trip. No, I'm not giving you a guilt trip. I'm just giving you some reality. And then I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm like giving it to you, taking it away, give it, boom. Someone said we're getting some good news. But before we get to good news, we have to know this price. Someone say price. So what does the law do? Like God gave all these Ten Commandments. What did they do for us? This is what it did. It showed us how sinful we are. Because if God didn't tell you 
that lusting is adultery, you wouldn't know it's a sin. If God didn't tell you that stealing is wrong, you would say, you justify your stealing and say, no, where in the Bible does it say stealing is wrong? I'm like Robin Hood. I take from the rich and I give to the poor. That's what I do. Because we were be good at justifying our sin. So God says, you already know it's sin and I know how you could justify it. So let me just write it down so you know it's wrong. And not only this, I'm going to write it down so you know it's wrong, but you also know there's consequences. So look what the law did. Romans 3.20. No, no person, check this out, will be made right with God by doing what the law says. No person will be made right with God by doing what the law says. Say, wait a second. So you're saying I can't get right with God if I perfectly obeyed the Ten Commandments? This is the problem. You can't perfectly obey the Ten Commandments, homie. Before we leave here, probably use God's name in vain by accident. Before we, we go in the parking lot, you might all of a sudden lust after someone like accidentally. <laughs> Before we leave here, you already stole something that belongs to God because you didn't give your tithes. Praise the Lord. Little, some little thieves up in here. We put things before God. Some of us right now, you got an addiction before your God. That's your G-O-D. Small G-O-D gives you no power. It destroys your dignity. It destroys your future. It destroys your peace. It destroys your integrity. You're lying. You're cheating. You're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. For that little God that's destroying you, it gives you a little pleasure and it gives you a whole bunch of torment. It got you stealing from your own mama. You know, back in the day, you wouldn't let someone talk about your mom. Like, what'd you say about, about what? My, my mom? Those are fighting words, and now you're stealing from her for your God. Hey, I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying how we all are apart from God. So no person we made right with God by doing what the law says. Look at this. The law... Shows us how sinful we are. What does the law do? So these commandments are a mirror. We look at them and we start realizing, I fall short. Now, what's so good about realizing you fall short? You just realize that you're a sinner. In need of a savior. Saving you from what? The consequences, the judgment, and the punishment that comes with our sin. So many of us know God as a savior, and Jesus is your savior if you call on him to save you. But if you never call on him to save you, one day you store up the wrath and he'll be your judge. Look at this. What is the purpose of the law? The, the law showed us how sinful we are. Number two, the law showed us how serious the consequences are for our sin. It started making us realize that if I commit adultery, you know what the price was for adultery? Death as well. Imagine you're living in a community where every week they're killing people in the public square for these type of sins. How aware would you be? Girl, get away from me. I'm not trying to get killed up in here. You ain't worth that. Crazy. You better lift that blouse up, drop that cleavage. Stop it. <laughs> How many understand? That was really happening. Say, man, did you hear what happened to Samantha? What? 
She got caught in adultery. She's out there in the public square. She is dead. <laughs> what, up, what happened to Hugo where, that was committing adultery with her? He running, man. <laughs> He's in another town right now. They're looking for him, though. They got a hit on him, too. I guarantee you this. You be like realizing I'm not about adultery. <laughs> Honey, I love you. I love you so much. I'll never look at another woman. I promise you. <laughs> you know what we've lost? The fear of God. Right now we sin like there's no consequences, there's no price, there's no future, there's no judgment, there's no God. Just because you feel like you're getting away with it doesn't mean there's not a major price waiting for you in your future. Death is waiting for you in your future. Judgment's waiting for you in your future. Come on, misery's waiting for you in your future. Pain is waiting for you in your future. No sin comes without a price. Some of us, when we get caught in sin and you get in trouble, you get all mad. Don't get mad. Be grateful you got caught on this side of life. I know it might be embarrassing and I know you might be mad at someone, come on, someone, someone t uh, ratted you out. I saw your husband at the bar the other day with another girl. Rat them out. You know why? Because if, come on, if you get him right here, he could be saved here. So he has to face it over there. Come on, let's get it right if we have to. Come on, we got to expose that sin. Some of us are too loyal with our sin buddies to be loyal to God. Oh, man. The law shows us how sinful we are. Look at this. Romans 4, 15 says, for the law brings, is, what the law brings is punishment. What does the law bring? Why does it bring punishment? Because when God shows us his standards, we break it. And after we break it, the, remember the law comes with blessing and it comes with curses. When we break it, we release a curse over our lives. Now and for later. So this is the good news. Praise the Lord. I just thank God there's a way to get right with God without having to obey 613 rules. Because I think in every single one of us, there's almost like a rebellious part of us. They give you a rule and say, oh, really? I'll break it. Don't you give me a rule. I promise you, give me another rule, I'll break that one too. <laughs> How many know that's the rebellious nature in us? It's not right, but we do. So God has showed us a way to be right. Someone say, get right with God. So what Jesus said, I'm not going to destroy the law, abolish the law. I'm not going to destroy none of it until, fill, until it fulfills its purpose. Until it fulfills what? So the purpose was to show us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Show us that we're what? Sinners in need of what? Do we need a Savior? Because we're all in trouble because we've all sinned and we're storing up wrath, eternal separation from God. Right now, we got generational curses on our families because of unrepented sin. Our kids are getting depressed at younger ages because we haven't repented of our adult sin. So we're passing on curses to our children. They haven't even got to do the sin yet, but they got the consequences and the curse already because we've not repented. Praise the Lord. Okay, I can't get right by trying to obey the law. So how did Jesus accomplish the purpose of the law? Now, how did Jesus do this as a man? Jesus accomplished the law by living a fully obedient life. Who, Jesus lived a fully obedient life. Someone say fully obedient. fully obedient. That means that Jesus accomplished the law by fully obeying the law, not sinning, not, not giving into even one sin. Jesus was 100% is 100% sinless. In 1 Peter 2.22, Christ did not sin 
or even tell a lie. Christ was with, without guile, no lie, 100% pure. So what did he do? He took our place. He goes, you know, you can't do it. Step back. Let me do it for you. Let me live a perfect life for you. And let me gain a perfect record for you. Let me gain righteousness for you. So when you put your trust in me, it won't be your record that you stand before God with or stand before me. It'll be my record. I lived a perfect life. And when you're in Christ, you get his record, his credit, not yours. But if you don't have Christ, all you got is your sin, your judgment. And you're going to die and hate it. Because you will not be in a better place. You will stand before the Jesus that could have saved you and that lived a righteous life for you and he'll be judging you when he should have been your savior. And for some of us right now, we're right now reaping consequences and this is what God is saying to some of you. Stop being hard-headed. What is it going to take for you to finally surrender your life to Jesus? Look at this. Jesus accomplished a lot by fulfilling his prophecy by coming as a savior. So in Genesis twenty-two eighteen, 18, it says, and your seed Christ shall, um, and in your seed Christ shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This was thousands of years before Jesus showed up. It was prophesying that a Messiah, a savior would come to bless people. Jesus did not come to judge you. Jesus came to save you, bless you help you, strengthen you, forgive you. And we'll end it with this. Jesus accomplished what the law could not accomplish. Right standing with God. Instead of you bringing a sacrifice, a bull, a ram, a goat, or you bringing yourself to be sacrificed, for your own sins, Jesus says, hold up. I'll live it and I'll die for you. I'll pay the price for your sin. I'll take, I love you so much, I'll take on your curse and remove your guilt. You can be forgiven if you place your faith, not in religion, not in a person, but in Jesus Christ, your Savior. He paid the price for all the wrong we've done. He fulfilled the law. He showed us we're sinners in need of a Savior. He came as a Savior and he paid the ultimate price. He paid the price by giving his life for every single sin. The blood of goats, the blood of bulls wasn't enough. So God sent the perfect blood of his only son to die for you, to show you how much you're worth so you can be forgiven and have a blessed life. You can have a new life today. In Galatians 2, 16, it says this, but we know that no one is made right with God by following the law because the law all it does is show us we're sinners and show us that there's punishment for sin. We're made right with God. It is entrusting in Jesus Christ that makes us a person right with God. So we have put our faith in Christ Jesus because we wanted to be made right with God so we didn't put our faith in ourselves and our works and our goodness but his goodness and we are right with him because we trusted in Christ not because we followed the law I can say this because no one can be made right with God by following the law. Jesus did this. He died in your place. And because he died in your place, 
the father holds back his wrath that was directed towards us. And he directs it towards his son. So when Jesus was on that cross, you know what he was saying? I love you so much. You are hopeless. You cannot help yourself because you're a sinner deserving judgment. But I've never sinned and I don't deserve judgment. So I'll take your sin and I'll suffer and I'll bleed and I'll take your guilt and I'll take your shame. And I'll give you my right stand and I'll give you my forgiveness. I'll give you my freedom. I'll give you my joy. I'll give you my peace. And this is what's so awesome. And I'll never take it away. Come on, give God some praise. I'll never take it away. I'll make you right and I'll never take it away. Come on, give God some praise that you have placed your faith in Jesus and he's forgiven you and the curse has been removed. Let's all stand up. Pastor Robert, can you close us out, please? Because this, 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 oh, Christian's here. Oh, Christian's singing, I forgot. I thought Christian wanted to take over the mic. Now, guys, how many receive a word from God tonight? How many understand the Bible a little better now? How many understand what Jesus did for him now? Now, understand this. Believing in I want you to get this. Knowing that we're all sinners. We ain't nobody better than nobody here. You look at those Ten Commandments, we broke every one of them, I think. And because we broke every one of them, the law doesn't help us because there's a blessing for obeying them, but we broke them. So all we're left with is the curse and the punishment. And when we feel the pain of our sin, this is what we do. We try to escape it through drugs, drinking, escapism. And we get ourselves deeper in the hole. It's time for you to finally realize, I can't fix me. I can't save me. Jesus saved me. Make me whole. When Jesus saves you, he'll forgive you. He'll, come, he'll bring his spirit inside of you to empower you to live a new life. You come the way you are. You don't fix yourself and come to God. You come as a sinner just like me. You come to God. He saves you. He delivers you. You put your faith in. He gives you a new life. And today's your day. Pastor Robert, let's lead him in that prayer. Yeah, how many enjoyed that word tonight? Wasn't that great? Now, here we go. Now, here's our opportunity to now, we, we hear the word of God, we just heard it. Now, we have to take it in action right now. This is the time now to apply what we've just learned right now. Trying to obey the law, the Old Testament, can't do it, it's impossible. Jesus came. The last scripture we just read in order to get right with God, this is all we have to do, is put our faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Whoa, where'd that come from? Some of the right. Pastor Mark was like echoing off the things here. <laughs> crazy back here. Oh, there he goes. He's back there. I was like, whoa, where'd he go? <laughs> so here we are. If you're saying, Pastor, you know what? I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to be forgiven of all my sins, everything that I've done wrong. Today is your day to get right with God. Today is your day. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's not next month. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Pastor Marco said earlier, life is like a vapor. We're here for a second and we're gone. So before we leave this auditorium today, before you disconnect online, let me ask you this question. If you were to die today and you would stand before God, are you going to make it in heaven? How do we get to heaven again? Just placing our faith in Jesus. So if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I want to be forgiven of all my sins. I want to make sure if I die today, then I would go straight to heaven. I want to put my faith in God. Or maybe you're here today and you've been running and even backsliding, running from God. You're saying, man, I just want a new start today. I've been going this way and I, I just want to turn back with God. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus tonight. I'm going to count to three. All across this auditorium, those that are watching online right now, if you're saying, Pastor, I want to get right with God. 
I want to place my faith in him. I want God to forgive me of all my sins. If that is you, slip your hands up when I count to three. Don't let nothing hold your hand down. This is you and God. This is you and eternity right now. Do not let this moment pass you by. When I count to three, all those who want to place their faith in Jesus, raise your hands or rededicate your life to God. One, two, three. Right now, raise your hands. Raise your hands. So I want to give my life to Jesus. I see a hand over there. I see a hand over there way in the back. I see a hand right here. Good job. I want to, I want to give my life to Jesus. I see a hand over here. I want to rededicate my life to God. I see a couple hands way over there in the back. I see a hand right over here. All those just raise your hands. I want you to come forward. Come meet me here down in the front. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer today to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Come on down. Even if you didn't raise your hands. Come, 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 come. Yes, today's your day. Today is your day. Come, come. Yes. The curse is being removed right now. Come. We're going to break all generational curses. Come, 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 come. Come. The curse is being broken right now. The curse over sin is going to be broken right now. Come, come, come. You got 20 more seconds. Come. 20 more seconds. Come. Come give your life to Jesus. This is your day. Give God a big shout of praise. 29 people up here right now. Say, you know what? I want to give my life to Jesus. This is your day. This is your day. Every head by every eyes closed. You're watching us online right now. And you're saying, that's, Pastor, you can't see me. But I raised my hand. I'm standing right there in my living room. Right there in my job. Say this prayer right there with us. You'll be saved. Those watching online. As soon as you say this prayer, you're going to go to igotsaved.com. And we're going to help you with your walk with God. Every head by every eyes closed. Maybe you didn't come up, but you're at your seat right now. And you're saying, man, how come I didn't go down? And your heart's beating right now. Hands might be getting all sweaty. You said, man, what am I doing at my seat? I should have went down there. What am I doing? It's okay. Just say that prayer right there at your seat. God's going to meet you there. But I do ask this, if you say it at your seat, come let one of us know. We just want to pray with you and help you with your walk with Christ. Every head by every eyes closed. Online, get ready. Say this prayer with us as well. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I ask forgiveness. I repent of all the sins I've committed. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross and paying the penalty for my sins Jesus come into my heart become my Lord and Savior Holy Spirit fill me Jesus tonight I ask you to set me free from all my addictions I ask you Jesus to break every generational curse Jesus I thank you me and my house me and my family we will serve the Lord. Use me to reach my family. Use me to reach my friends. Thank you, Jesus. I am saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.